Hello, everyone. I'm Gao with Chrome at X, and I'm here uh, to interview um, one of our esteemed Chrome at X external research program investigators uh, as part of the celebration of the 10 for 10, 10 year anniversary of our industry leading program that involves collaboration between the uh, industry and academia. And today I'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Bruni Felding. Uh, Dr. Felding is an associate professor of medicine at the Scripps Research Institute. <clears throat> She's a renowned breast cancer researcher. And one of her areas of focus is on the role of NAD in preventing uh, cancer metastasis. Uh, and so uh, Bruni is also a member of the Chromadex Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, and so without any further delay, let's get to our interview. Okay. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Felding. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, SERP, uh, what we call 10 for 10, celebrating 10 years of SERP, which is really hard to believe. Um, and so... Uh, I, uh, I just want to ask you a few questions and have a little bit of a dialogue, if you don't mind. Um, enjoy that so uh, first, what we'd love to know about is a, a little bit about yourself, uh, background and your research interests, your research area, if you could explain a little bit. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much, um, Andrew, and please call me Bruni. Uh, we have known each other for such a long time and, you know, sure. I, I treasure this interaction. So um, yes, thank you. Uh, as you know, you know I'm uh, a cancer researcher, and that is really my passion and my mission. And I think it's you know my life's goal um, to help cancer patients indirectly because I'm not a, a medical uh, caregiver right. or a medical expert, but I do um, you know influence the field. I would say you know with our research and with our results and also the digests of the research that is out there in the field, I think is very, very important. And also um, I'm very active in uh, the scientific review arena. I have been for years a member of NIH study sections where um, we provide as, as scientists, we provide as best as we can unbiased review of research proposals that come in, you know, to select the, to help the NIH to select the best science for funding and for enriching really um, not only the individual science fields, but also the community at large. Right. And uh, yeah, and so my uh, <laughs> my own kind of, I don't really, you know, I ha I don't have a personal uh, reason really, you know, why I picked this, this um, arena other than when I was a graduate student, I had the privilege really and the opportunity. And I think this is something that speaks for all of us uh, to be affiliated with the group with a professor that um, in this group was analyzing oncogenes back in the day that has been quite mm -hmm. a while right? and it was a really new concept and it was sure. analyzed in a fish model and um, the the advantage of the fish model I mean these these are the um, uh, zebra fish that are commonly right. used these days, even today, you know, in right. cancer research because they have qualities that that are uh, useful. And so this group, this professor and and his team, um, really instilled in me the interest in trying to find out how cancer works and what we can do uh, to beat it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and he was also, you know, he was a PhD, and he, but but even back in the day, he interfaced very uh, actively, and this was melanoma research that I engaged in, in my PhD work. He he made contact uh, for all of us in his group with clinicians nearby, you know, in the same building, essentially. And uh, I I will never forget advice that one of the professors in uh, medical oncology in melanoma gave you know and and these things they get in, ingrained into your brain so but what i want to say with this is that you know once you're on a track and you really find your passion and your mission 
in that I, I had the privilege of being able to pursue this all my throughout my scientific career. Mm -hmm. And in, in doing so, you know, I I I went from our little it was not really little, but it was kind of a university that didn't, you know, wasn't like a, a super big on the map back in Germany, but I branched out and did postdoctoral fellowships uh, in also in the US at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And then I went to uh, Scripps Research and then I had a research lab back in Germany at Merck, you know, so it was kind of a, a transition. I meant to go translational, you know, so my move to Merck was like a big, big step into trying to get into the um, pharmaceutical arena to see sure. you know, if, if I could help translate knowledge that the the academia is generating into an advantage for patients really and it was it was a fantastic time um that gave me the opportunity also to come back here to scripts which where i have been ever since you know sure so, and i think this is how we got connected really back in the day yes because we had a paper um and I will tell you how we got into NAD metabolism. Like yes, that would be my next question, obviously, yeah. is, is how, how does the transition and when did the transition happen into looking at, at NAD's role? And then, of course, specifically uh, niagen nicotinamide riboside. Yes. How you did know, that fit into your research? And, and, and I would say, you know, that was really the paradigm example that I tend to follow in, you know, when I, so you research and you are, I have this other really big field, you know, where I have made major discoveries and I'm, I'm still very connected with that and uh, writing papers and, and whatnot and grants. But the NAD came to me, you know, it landed in my lap, basically, in a sense. Interesting. Uh, unexpectedly and and but the way it goes is okay you read the research and you encounter suddenly an unexpected paper that really influences you deeply and this is this is how this whole thing with the nad metabolism came up i mean i'm a biochemist by training and i you know i have studied biochemistry enzymology and stuff like that uh, including metabolism back in the day but i didn't think you know that it would be like a center in, in the questions that we were addressing. But the way it happened was, okay, there was a paper that came out in science and it was published by a, a group in Japan. And what it said was that um, mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, the organelles mm -hmm. that generate mm -hmm. our energy um, components biochemically that are key and essential for basically all of our metabolic events and for our activity as we sit here, you know, and uh, in a physically active and our heart that beats, you know, only because it has mitochondria that are very active and productive. Yeah. And so in this paper, the take home message was that in cancer cells, it seems to be important what mitochondria do. It seems to be even more important than what the nucleus does when it comes to determining how aggressive a cancer cell is and okay. what this uh what this and it was a nature paper or science paper and how it was done was essentially it was a, an approach that is a little you know harsh but the outcome was that they um the group had swapped um mitochondria from one cancer cell type to another leaving the nucleus as is, you know, so in other words, you had a recipient cell that kept its own nucleus, but now was given mitochondria from another cell. And the take home message, the outcome of this surprisingly across a spectrum of different cancer cell types was that each time the cancer cells were given mitochondria stemming from a very aggressive cancer type, the aggressiveness was transferred to the recipient. And that was then consolidated in mass experiments, you know, and it was like a, a fantastic study. So I thought, you, you, you know, I mean, it was, and this is how I, you know, this is how this captivated me, but really what drove the, the uh, NAD metabolism into this was the following. And this is, you know, how, how good fortune, I would say, you know, comes into your life. And if you realize it, you know, and follow it, you, you have really the good fortune in your hand to, to dig deep into. And what it was, was um, 
in our building also, you know, part of scripts, there was on the floor above me, um, two good friends had a laboratory, also a Japanese crew, Akemi and Takao Yagi, and they were researching mitochondria. And, you know, we had discussions um, early on about all kinds of things, about energy metabolism, this and that, you know, the heart function, uh, and, you know, and neuronal functions. And I was very pleased, you know, and, and struck by the clarity of the results that they had when they manipulated mitochondria in a way to more, make them more efficient mm -hmm. and more productive in terms of energy production. And so I said to them, I, I sent them this paper that we just discussed, you and I, and I said, please, can you read this? And I want to come and ask you, do you have a key reagent for me that we can use in our group to analyze what the mechanism is that enables mitochondria coming from an aggressive cell to transfer this aggressiveness to a recipient cell. And they went back and forth a little bit. And then they said, yes, we do have a key reagent for you. And that was the NDI1. You know, the NDI1 is a yeast gene um, that, and it encodes the NADH dehydrogenase. Okay which in yeast is a single gene in the, in uh, in mitochondria and in mammals like you and me and uh, everybody in our species we have um, a complex one which is you know more than 20 up to 40 uh, components to it which together work to produce the NADH dehydrogenase activity that is the first pass when a molecule gets into the mitochondria to regenerate the energy and finally yeah. ATP. So they gave me this yeast gene and they had it in a vector that they used to transduce neuronal cells. And by the by, you know, these neuronal cells, their goal was to um, analyze Parkinson's uh, damaged neurons. And what they could show at the cellular level and at the animal level was that when you restored the NADH dehydrogenase activity, in case of Parkinson's disease, the neurons behaved normal. They could basically abolish the disease. It was like a miracle to me, right? And and um, I wish they could have gone on to develop a gene therapy, but you know, this is another story, but it goes to show how important mitochondrial function is. And in our case, uh, so we took this uh, yeast gene and, um, we transduced, meaning we expressed this yeast gene in tumor cells, in human breast cancer cells. And lo and behold, uh, all of the cells, different cell types that we had analyzed and treated in this way, the cells, the recipient cells of this gene had not only normalized NAD metabolism, and here comes the NAD metabolism in the sense of the word, but they also had lost their aggressiveness. And what, what really stood out, you know, I, ha I have a tendency, it's, it's actually um, a paradigm, <laughs> if you will, in, in my lab, if we have um, evidence that a molecular pathway that we discover at the cellular level seems to be important, I tend to do, ask my, my um uh, co-workers in the lab to do an animal experiment in order to see if the observation that we have in our culture systems does have an impact on the phenomenology, really on the aggressiveness or the capability of a tumor cell to exert its tumor cell capabilities. And the answer from all of this was that all of the tumor cells that we had transduced with this yeast gene to normalize the NAD metabolism behaved almost like normal cells in the animals. And the most obvious and the most penetrating to me amazing result was that they had essentially lost their metastatic capabilities. So um, that was basically how I ended up studying <laughs> NAD metabolism. And this is why um, we also included in our study, you know, from knowing now that NAD metabolism is key and that mitochondrial function is the first pass that the cells use in order to function properly in their energy ge uh, um, generation. And then it, it basically penetrates into the entire um, 
functionality of the cell, which includes in a tumor cell to act like a tumor cell or not. Um, in, in each case, we also ask then the, the question immediately, is there a way in which we, we might um, use this knowledge to help people, really help people with cancer and to prevent essentially metastatic disease? That was the goal and that was the indication of the results that we had generated. So in, in the first study that we did, um, it was an easy, I mean, it was basically after this gene therapy, if you will, with the NDI1 gene, the next easy and also immediately translatable step really was to supplement, in this case, the cells and then the mouse as a model for um, the disease in, in a living being with NAD precursors, <laughs> you know, because, and, and we had tested this out in, in um, cell studies in vitro and realized that if, if we supplemented the tumor cells in vitro, even the ones that didn't receive the, um, the normalized NADHD hydrogenase yeast gene, we could blunt, we could inhibit their metastatic activity. And that translated really into, um, are you still there, Andrew? <laughs> I'm sorry, Bruni, the power went out. Uh, let's see if this is still recorded. The, 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 to the whole okay. house, the power went out for one second and then came back on. Uh huh. Well, you know, while, while you were gone, <laughs> and I did, you know, I just kept talking. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, don't worry about it, because there may be actually a recording of what you didn't hear, but what I said in the meantime, which was quite a bit. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we do this? Because. But let me, um, let me finish my sentence here, because there was at some point in time, you know, I saw a little uh, banner uh, um, popping up that said recording in progress. So maybe, you know, you have the recording. Who knows? Oh, it is. It says it's recording. It does say it's recording. It okay. Kept, I think it kept going. It kept going. Okay. Well, they'll be able to edit edit this out. <laughs> Hopefully. That was really <laughs> awesome. Well, <laughs> that's the way it goes. But you know, oh. but it went in stages because the first thing I noticed was that uh, your image froze. You froze, know, it, right. it froze, and then you disappeared altogether. You know, and then I, you could see me. I mean, I could see myself. You know, this is like you know, I'm on the other end of Zoom here. Right. And that that arm essentially was still working, so I ca I just kept talking. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see if they if they are able to continue it, but. I guess it's a good opportunity for us to um, transition to uh, describing your your own research now uh, involving NAD and um, Niagen NR uh, that you have uh, you've done or that that's ongoing. Yes, and that is a very logical, <laughs> you know, continuation. And I must say that um, being one of your soybeans, <laughs> I think the first one, you know, that the, the paper I was describing uh, while the power was out, I guess, the first paper that came out um, was realized, I think, by your colleagues uh, back in the day, and they connected with me, and I connected then very int intensively with them, because here's the point, you know, this is also one thing which is um, key, I would say, to my experience uh, with Chromadex and also with the field in general, right? So now, um, before the power went out, <laughs> but maybe still in the recording, you know, one of one of the key messages that I that I took and uh, the steps that we um, then followed were the, were okay. We had demonstrated that an active, a functional, a normalized NAD metabolism makes a tumor cell less aggressive yes mm -hmm. that right. was that was the the take home message which you could see at different levels at different with different readouts molecularly genomically uh, metabolically in vitro in in the culture system but you could also and that was the best and most important finding you could also see this very clearly when you put um the when you transferred the tumor cells when you implanted them into a recipient mice and the recipient mice no longer had metastases. You know, that essentially meant that um, with this 
normalization, you had basically blunted pretty much in our systems and various cell models extinguished the ability of the tumor cell to colonize the the organism as a whole, meaning, you know, they were really not behaving like metastatic tumor cells anymore, which was like, to me, you know, the breakthrough per se. And I, you know, that was my life's dream <laughs> mm -hmm. to get metastatic activity out of a tumor cell, because that's, you know, as we all know, um, the major cause of death in cancer patients. Right. Um, so then, you know, of course, the question became, oh, you know, one thing could be we could do a gene therapy with the NDI1 gene from yeast, but much easier would be, you know, if we could supplement NAD sure. metabolism to actually achieve possibly the same result. That was the big right. question, right? Right. And at that point in time, I mean, we, we connected very intensively uh, because no one else has, <laughs> as we know, and as we had, you know, at, at Scripps, we have, um, I would say, superpower mass spectrometry and metabolomics capabilities. And I couldn't find a better product, you know, of, of this key metabolite NAD uh, uh, and uh, NR nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide uh, at, at a greater purity, you know, and reliability than from Chromadex. So we were uh, privileged to collaborate and I, I was super happy, you know, to be also chosen to be the first uh, SERP investigator and to carry out this study which i would have otherwise not been able to push you know as, as sure. far as we did go and the approach is or was and still is you know this is we come to the presence here in a second uh that you could um either or both in our animal models or these pre preclinical studies we you could expose the tumor cells in culture to the NAD precursor, meaning nicotinamide or nicotinamide ribside. And I have to say that in all of the metabolic and molecular approaches that we took, we compared these metabolites side by side and they were very effective, but nicotinamide ribside is always more effective in whatever readout we took. And I haven't quite figured out yet, you know, how um, what essentially, and I think Charlie Brenner and I will, we're going to know this at some point. <laughs> Or and, and other people in the field, but the um, the outcome was that you could supplement tumor cells before you put them into an animal, or you could grow the disease in an animal and then um, supplement the animal. Actually, actually, you know, your experimental patient was now given a supplement, a dietary supplement in the form mm -hmm. of uh, nicotinamide or nicotinamide riboside. And lo and behold, in all of the approaches that we took in all of the different mainly cancer cell type, I mean, breast cancer cell lines and cell models, uh, did we find that the metastatic activity was greatly blunted, was almost undetectable. And to me, you know, that is still um, a, a very, you know, deep treasure trove to dig in. And this is what we're doing currently. Sure. We're trying to figure out what the mechanisms are that enable that. But the fact that you could, with a single compound, a small molecule, you know, that we all consume in our food and which is necessary in our food, you know, we would not be happy in life if we wouldn't uh, ingest these precursors. Um, when we supplemented um, animals with that, you could really drastically change the outcome of the disease. Right. So, so tell me, uh, uh, Bruni, is the the role of of NAD in those animal models? Is it impacting the cancer cells directly, or is it um, enhancing the effectiveness of the immune uh, cells, immune system, to attack uh, and, and prevent metastasis, to attack the cancer cells, prevent metastasis? You know, Andrew, that is a very, very important question, and it drives home essentially, you know, the um, the questions and the associated approaches that we are following right now. So, in the culture back in the day, you know, when we had the isolated tumor cells, there was no microenvironment, there was no host cell, there was no immune cell uh, in the system. You could already see, based on 
the genomic outfit of, of the gene expression pattern of the tumor cells that they had, you can change the gene expression pattern of a tumor cell in culture. Um, and what we saw is that there is a um, an inhibition of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is a key part, it's one of the hall, hallmarks of cancer really. Um, it means that uh, an epithelial cell, one that normally sits in a tissue and behaves, you know, as part of a normal tissue, um, the epithelial to mesenchymal transition means that the epithelial cells that normally sit in this tissue now behave like a fibroblast in a wound healing situation, meaning that these cells now become motile, they become invasive, and they leave the site. They're not sitting there uh, uh, static in the tissue and behave and are part of this normal tissue function anymore, but they can move and be, you know, and in in a, in the uh, case of a cancer, they can become metastatic. And so the the mere, I call it metabolic reprogramming in a, in a tumor cell in culture indicates to you already that there is a profound impact on the phenotype and the reactivity and the functional capabilities in a tumor cell. Now, the other part that you touched upon is what is the rest of the body doing to the you know to, to the presence of these cancer cells in let's say your mouse experiment and here you know the this is something that we're following very actively right now because we just recently established um at scripts and i was kind of um spearheading this activity a little bit the uh, spatial genomic profiling capabilities uh, together with proteomic profiling, meaning, you know, that let's say, okay, you have your cancer model, you have your mouse, you inject tumor cells into the memory fat pad, which is the breast of the mouse, and you observe a, a little tumor to form. And then you check to see if down the road, there are metastases, for instance, in the lungs, which is the preferred organ in uh, breast right. cancer, mice and in people. And so, um, now you feed this mouse with a nut precursor. You give nicotinamide, you give nicotinamide riboside, most effectively nicotinamide riboside. What do you see? You see, you know, overall that there's almost no metastasis in the lungs spontaneously from this little tumor forming in the breast. Then, of course, you know, now we read the literature and you had, you know, we had discussed in the past one very uh, impactful one that we both liked a lot and I have seen more and you have seen more and we hear it at conferences from our colleagues you know that oh um, the immune reactivity to let's say an in, to a, a, a pathogen invasion let's say there is a bacterial infection there's a viral infection yes. in our, from our standpoint it's a an invader from you know within it's basically a tumor cell that causes a reaction um, in a person's body to to essentially um, destroy this tumor, recognize the tumor right. as foreign and to destroy it. And as you know, you know, in cancer, this is um, a process that is not oftentimes won by the immune system. Right. It can initially be very effective, but eventually the tumor cells can reprogram the immune response and actually make it more favorable for tumor growth rather mm -hmm. than allowing it to kill, you know, the tumor right. cell and, and stop the disease. Right. So here's, here's the point that you're bringing up. Right. But well, what we're looking at right now, you know, is, so what is the immune microenvironment in the tumor? Let's say in the mouse's primary tumor in the, in the breast tissue. And what is it like in the lung when you, let's say you let the disease develop. Okay, the patient comes to the clinic and is diagnosed. There's already a primary tumor. Now, of course, uh, steps have to be taken to prevent the disease from advancing. So in the clinic, if possible, this is um, surgery is the first line of action if that's an option. Um, sometimes these days and back in the day, you know, repeated um, what we have done or what, what um, oncology has done in the past. Um, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is given to shrink a tumor uh, and then a surgery is done to hopefully eradicate the disease by taking out the whole thing. Right. In my, in my view, you know, it's it's a little double-edged sword. And I've discussed this, you know, with friends at MD Anderson and other people because, you know, 
now, as we know, you know, you and I, we sit in, we think, oh, uh, chemotherapy, okay, chemotherapy oftentimes is not very friendly to the immune system, right? Yep. So, you know, so you fight fire with fire and, and you right. know, so it's a hard thing to do, but right. it's a hard battle to win. It's a very, very hard battle to win. But so our current uh, <laughs> approach to trying to figure out in the first place what is happening and how would we best approach this entire scenario? You know, you, you see the person coming to the clinic. What is the first line of action that you would recommend? Uh, on top of you know the vast information that is in clinical pathology and uh, uh, oncolo oncologic pathology, and I work very very closely with a um, breast cancer pathologist, you know, to learn all of the um, of the difficulties you know that they are facing with making not only the diagnosis but making a recommendation for how a person should best be treated. So. In our mouse experiments, I can tell you that um, we see a great difference in the immune microenvironment, not only in the primary tumor, and but also in the lung. You know, when where we're looking at metastases at different sites, and lung is our current main model. You know, as to where we're looking, and what we're seeing is that uh, um, so. In the tumor microenvironment lingo, if you will, you know, you talk about a hot tumor or a cold tumor. And these these buzzwords are given because initially a tumor is hot. And it means, you know, that a tumor uh, has instigated an immune response and the tumor um the uh, the immune cells are generating a hot environment, meaning you know they're fighting the tumor. There are cytokines, right. and there's activity going on. They're all meant to kill the tumor cells and to right. block their proliferative responses. Now, eventually, like we just discussed, you know the um, the tumor cells produce factors that inhibit this hot activity uh, of the immune cells trying to kill the tumor and then the tumor microenvironment turns into a cold immune microenvironment meaning you know that the tumor tumor has won and the immune cells are actually doing producing factors that force the tumor growth more than inhibit it so but with uh and this is like pre-published <laughs> information you know but what, what what we do see we do see evidence that um when you supplement and it it's not a thing that happens overnight. You know, the timing has to be right. And the duration of uh, the treatment has to be also very, very carefully considered. And these are, you know, fine tuning experiments that we're doing right now. What you see is that, um, okay, let's say tumor cells have arrived in the lung and you realize that clinician has means to image and see evidence of metastatic disease. And at that point in time, you know, and we model this in the mouse because we can say, okay, we'll give the mouse nicotinamide riboside, for instance, from the beginning of the disease. We can tune it. We know what's going on. In the clinic, you don't have that luxury. Right. You know, the right. person goes to the to the clinic whenever symptoms arise, whenever the right. disease is so. So you have to deal with the status at the right. moment and in the moment. And so, therefore, we are modeling, you know, the time sequence of event right. and is there a way in which you can help the immune system? And the answer is yes, you can help the immune system and you can help particularly, you know, cytotoxic uh, immune cells that have the capability of killing tumor cells um, to remain, I would say, remain, you know, have this hot uh, tumor microenvironment phenotype to continue to fight the tumor. And so that's, I think, one thing which I really, really am very, very excited about. And, you know, it would be hard uh, to, it would be very hard. I have tried. I, <laughs> you have heard me talk about this before. You know, I have talked to clinicians and said, even in the in the beginning, you know, very beginning after our first paper, I talked to clinicians and I had some super important responses from clinicians because I suggested, why don't we just try you know, to supplement patients with uh, NAD precursors, nicotinamide riboside would be the, the front runner. Right. No and um, understandably, clinicians um, tend to not 
deviate from standard of care protocols. Right. And it wasn't sure, you know, we didn't have enough evidence. We didn't have the whole gamut of, you know, all of the different control arms. How do you and when do you supplement? How does this affect the standard of care therapy? It's very hard to say. And one person <laughs> in particular, you know, he he was actually um, a clinician, but also um, a pharmacologist and a, a clinical trial designer, I must say, right? I, I talk I talked to this person at some point in time and I said, hey, uh, this is what I would like to do. And like, you know, you know, my suggestion was uh, the minute you, you realize somebody has a breast tumor, you start supplementing. And can you affect the outcome? And this person said to me, well, what is, you know, what's the timeline? And I said, of course, you know, this in breast cancer, luckily, you know, the, the disease doesn't progress overnight and it takes sometimes years in many cases for patients uh, to their benefit. It takes five years, 10 years, even 20 years. Uh, for a disease to recur after they have, let's say, finished their standard of care um, treatment regimen. And so right. he, he looks me in the eye and he says, Bruni, do you have time? Bruni, do you have money? Do you have like millions? of it? And, and I said, right. well, I understand, you know, we, we can model this in the mouse, but then to to convince someone uh, in the clinic, well, a mouse sure. is a mouse, a person is a person, and we cannot, you know, so... The problem for the basic researcher always is uh, to, well, this is something that I'm also trying to predict, you know, to predict, to find biomarkers, let's say biomarkers in cancer patients that you could follow. And if you hear snoring here, that's my dog. <laughs> um, if, you, if you can identify biomarkers that go along with your observation in the long-term outcome, let's say in your mouse experiments, where everything in time in the, on the along the timeline is shrunk to weeks, month. You know the outcome of the disease that you monitor in in a mouse. Uh, it, everything happens much faster. Are there biomarkers that you can follow along the timeline of this disease progression and your intervention with, let's say. A supplementation with nicotinamide riboside, for example, you know, following our initial findings that really need to be um, examined in depth. I, I, I must say, I still want to see that. And uh, so that's one big thing that we're investigating right now. You know, and it should be in the mass, of course. You know, you can take out individual mice along the timeline and do a full-on analysis of their tissues of their genomic outfits of biomarkers at the protein level, at immune response criteria and so forth. In patients, you don't have that luxury. You know, you cannot take, you cannot um, biopsy yeah. there and there. So my, I always think very practically and patient oriented. So my current question is, can we obtain information along the timeline of, you know, the minute we know the disease exists and the minute we know what the stage of the disease is for a person and the oncologist says, this is your recommended treatment regimen. And then our question would come in and say, well, would this person benefit, let's say, from a, a supplement to enhance NAD metabolism the minute we know about it? At what point in time would it be best? You know, So along the timeline of all of this, are there means in which we can determine if there is a positive response, meaning, you know, is there a beneficial response in this person? And in my opinion, it has to be a minimally invasive uh, a probe, you know, a blood sample, um, even, even, you know, a sputum sample or something that's, or a blood sample is probably most, you know, um, reliable and attainable and you can analyze circulating tumor cells that are rare, but you can also analyze and now we're following basically, this is one of my uh, pet peeves really, you know, I have um, a background in hemostasis and thrombosis and um, the interaction of tumor cells with platelets in the circulation is very dear to my heart and to our research. And what we find essentially in, in 
in agreement with what's been shown or what is now uh, emerging in the field is that platelets can mop up basically uh, in little membrane fractions that tumor cells shed. So you don't have to isolate the entire tumor cell, but you can analyze platelets that are circulating and which have decorated themselves with pieces of, we call them exosomes uh, of tumor cells that can stem from either the primary tumor or metastatic lesion or from a circulating um, component of the disease to find ways in which we can reliably, let's say, monitor if a person who, let's say, would opt to say, uh, to take, let's say, uh, um, a supplement along with the standard of care, mm -hmm. can we define criteria by some minimally invasive genomic analyses to see if they have um, a beneficial response? Are they on the right track? Do we need to stop this or what is the best way to go? So that's totally so. So, Bruni, I want to uh, leave some time for some other questions. It's a fascinating work, and maybe it's a good segue into the next question, which is, what advice might you have for a junior scientist that's looking to get into this area of NAD metabolism and cancer, cancer metastasis? You mm -hmm. know what? What advice might you have for a junior scientist? And and then I have another follow up question after that yeah well thank you thank you for bringing this up because you know it's that's also something that's very dear to my heart because education you know is is, is one of my passions and I'm, I'm also the director of the cancer biology uh, program on our graduate school so you know I have uh, not only students in the lab sometimes that that um decide to work with our group on um, cancer metabolism but also um, students that attend lectures, you know, and the cancer biology course. So while they are while they are trying to find which area they would like to spend the next four, five, or six years of their life on and focus their their activity, um, if they decide to tackle cancer as as a disease, and it's a like we discussed in the beginning, Andrew, it's a very high bar. Sure. Um, it is a high, high bar, you know, and not many people these days. I mean, you can, what is really, I, will, I almost said fashionable, but, but it is also very, very important these days and has always been is um, technical, technological advances of how you approach a specific question. Um, and, and the goal, let's say, and the milestones to reaching this goal is not necessarily, you know, now I'm looking at it from the standpoint of a student, right? The student or a young investigator as, is asking themselves, um, what would I like to, what is it that I would like to focus on in my scientific career, in my way of life, because it consumes you, you know, I mean, it really consumes sure. you and you want to do something that you think is uh can help people or whatever you want to make your goal and your passion and your mission. Um, and in some cases, you know, some people, many people these days and opt to focus on technological approaches. Um, and the concept can then, let's say somebody else can do this using their technological approaches. But the point is uh, you need, you know, for technological approaches, you need to be in the right environment and you need to have access to um, high power instruments and uh, colleagues and so forth. If you have that, I think it is great. Um, and I would advise a person who would want to, you know, let's say is interested in doing something that would benefit cancer patients, but also other people, you know, who don't have cancer. <laughs> and uh, is still interested in, let's say, metabolism, I would say metabolomic and uh, and the, and the, uh, the com conversion I, uh, the, of uh, metabolomic analyses, proteomic analyses, and genomic analyses. So in other words, multiomics is really something that we need to understand better and influence each other. I mean, not that one person can do everything, but there are ways in which we can leverage platforms which are currently being developed um, at the instrument level, you know, to 
ever more refine the uh, sensitivity of mass spectrometry analyses, of proteomic analyses, but also bioinformatically, you know, then to be able to crunch these huge data sets and enable the, let's say the end user, let's say I were the end user because I'm sitting here, I'm trying to ask the end question, does somebody who has cancer uh, and take wants to take a food supplement that helps them, how can we analyze their body composition based on a minimally invasive probe um, in a way in which the person would learn whether or not what they're doing is helping them? Right. I mean, are the clinician to say is the the, the modified um, strategic therapeutic uh, advance here? Is it is it helpful or is it not helpful? And I think it, I I think that is a great arena these days where people are needed um, to find ways in which fields can be brought together big data sets can be crunched together to make meaning, you know, to, to, to present meaning to the field as a whole. And then as a group, I mean, we are a group of scientists and publications are public <laughs> and data sets are public and the NIH is really great. And then we have GitHub and other public uh, forums in which data sets are being exchanged where you have access to previously unprecedented depth of huge data sets, you know, that no one by themselves and alone can generate, analyze, and correlate. Uh, so I think this merging of information is a great opportunity that needs to be further um, developed. And I think we're making great right. strides in this. That's terrain. great. Yeah. Can you... Um... Uh, briefly, because we're running out of time, uh, uh, Bruni, but um, how has being part of the Chromadex external research program or being a SERPI, how has that helped you and, and your research? Well, I can say a couple of things. <laughs> One is that I could not have done, you know, what, what we did uh, essentially, you know, the initial things we 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 did, but the, the way it would the way in which um, research works is always okay. You have a finding, then you try to get money to expand this finding or to get, uh, go deeper. And if I hadn't uh, connected with uh, Chromadex, and if Chromadex hadn't decided to support my lab really and our research, we could not have done this absolutely a clear you know um there's a clear answer to that and i must say i'm super super grateful for that because um when you apply for grants you you try to tap into different resources if you can you know because you most of the time you get rejected <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? and especially if you come in with a new um concept or a new a viewpoint that isn't very streamlined at this moment in time you know when you bring forward your your approach or your concept and it is very very hard sometimes the NIH is great actually because as reviewers we sit there and we try to be unbiased and we give great ideas the best um, opportunity if you know the proposal is composed so that um, at the end of reading it you come to the conclusion that this person is asking important questions and has the means to um, follow these questions, has a collaborative team, and has a way in which they can test along the way whether or not they are on the correct uh, timeline, pipeline, and you know whether or not this is going in the right direction. Um, but sometimes you um, you cannot go forward because key experiments may be expensive, and that was the case in our experiments as well. Uh, we did mitochondrial sequencing of cancer cells, and without um, the support of Chromadex, we could not have done, uh, absolutely not have done. And also, we received funds for an instrument that was key, you know, to analyzing uh, tumor progression in the mice. So I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity. Um, it was essential. Great, <laughs> great. Well, um, we're just about out of 
time, um, Rooney. So it's been uh, really a pleasure um, interacting with you and ha having this discussion with you here um, for our uh, SERP 10 for 10 series. Always, uh, uh, I find always our discussions to be very informative and very fascinating. Oh, okay. So I wanna thank you again for uh, being part of the Chromadex External Research Program and for your time today. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk again very, very soon. Uh, so we wish you all the best and uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for all having, right. thank you for Wonderful. letting me share all this information and all my opinions with you. I very much appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.